Hello, listeners. I wanted to start off this episode by acknowledging the new normal we are all experiencing related to COVID-19. Seems like the situation is changing on an hourly basis. We're all experiencing new uncertainties and changes. And while this certainly comes with its challenges, which you don't need to be reminded about, I do also find it comforting and heartwarming in a way to know that we all worldwide are navigating this strange new reality together. And there are some very inspiring examples of the unifying effect of music and the resilience of humanity happening right now during this COVID-19 situation. I've been posting some of them on social media. You can check those out on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Today's episode is very apropos for this week with a look at those among us who are truly faced with the ultimate uncertainty in life. I hope that today's interview brings you perspective and hope and fresh appreciation for the unique functions of the gift of music. I'm Mindy Peterson, and this is Enhanced Life with Music, the layperson's guide to enjoying music's benefits. Our topic today is music as palliative care. Palliative refers to care that is focused on relief from pain, usually symptoms and stress of a serious illness. The goal is to improve quality of life for the patient and for their family. My guest today is Katie Lindenfelser, the founder and executive director of Crescent Cove. Crescent Cove is a vibrant and joyful home away from home right here in the Twin Cities for young people with life-threatening conditions. It offers respite care and hospice care for children through age 21. Their goal is to help families feel embraced, assured, and celebrated. Katie is a board-certified music therapist who studied music therapy at Augsburg University and at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you, Mindy. I'm happy to be with you. You were recommended to me by multiple people who are well-connected in the music world, so I'm extra thrilled to be talking to you today. You are highly endorsed. Oh, that means a lot. It's a beautiful community. It is. Well, Crescent Cove has a network of therapists who control pain and symptoms through a lot of different ways, art, pet therapy, healing touch, spiritual care, hydrotherapy. We, of course, today are focusing on music's use as palliative care. Talk to us about some of the ways Crescent Cove uses music therapy to relieve pain and increase quality of life for children and for their families. Well, we're grateful to share music with the children and the families who come to Crescent Cove in all different ways. Um, Some even are volunteers who share music, which is such a gift. And obviously, it has lots of benefits even for our staff and volunteers and the whole anybody who's at Crescent Cove at any given time, including the child and family. And then we have a team of music therapists from Alliance Music Therapy and also some music therapists who work in hospice and palliative care in our community who see the kids who come to Crescent Cove on a weekly basis. And it's such a special part of their stay when they come for respite and obviously creates those very meaningful, sacred moments and experiences when a child is dying and is used for both, you know, comfort and pain relief as the music therapists choose specific rhythms and music and songs that are calming or kind of match or address where they're at. And also for creativity and songwriting and for kids to be able to tell their stories, um, but then also some real engaging opportunities and experiences of making music with different rhythm instruments and drumming and um, singing and improvising and the whole gamut. I imagine that each situation is really different and tailored according to the situation, the age of the child, what level of pain or discomfort they might be experiencing, if they're there for respite care, if they're there for a longer time period, if the family's there. Absolutely. When we have a teenager and she'll be coming again this this week who I walk in sometimes and I'm not, you know, working there as a music therapist. So I just love hearing when the music therapists are there with our kids at Crescent Cove. 
And um, this particular teenager loves to sing and she has a gorgeous voice. So it's like one pop song after another. And she's just sings from her heart and from her wheelchair or from the hospital bed, wherever she is most comfortable. And the music therapist sort of supports her and accompanies her and harmonizes with her. And they just together make beautiful music and she's written songs. And then there are other situations, like you said, when a child is dying. And sometimes that looks like, you know, making music and singing. And other times it's playing very quiet, receptive music. That's, you know, the tempo is very gentle and soft and just really holding that sacred space for a child and their family Mm -hmm. to be in those moments together as they say goodbye to their son or daughter. Mm -hmm. When a music therapist comes in for the day, do they already know what patients they'll be working with and what kind of a situation if it's a teenager wanting to sing pop songs or if they're going to be kind of composing music with a young child, if they're going to be playing background music and a more solemn type of a situation? Yes, a music therapist usually is informed by our social worker or volunteer coordinator of which children are staying at Crescent Cove to anticipate their ages and their general diagnosis and musical interests, because we ask that of all of the kids who come and their families upon admission. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the music therapist always comes with the whole package of different rhythm instruments and their guitar or keyboard. Um, We also have the capacity through support from the Joe and Maddie Mower Foundation to record kids' heartbeats so that every child who comes, we record their heartbeat if their family is okay and interested in having that, their heartbeat recorded. And then sometimes the music therapist will make music with the child and as kind of over the rhythm of the child's heartbeat oh. or sing their favorite songs. And um, that's obviously very special and in the times that those pieces have been used at a child's funeral, very moving and almost, you know, just heart wrenching in a way, in a beautiful way, like yeah. so beautiful to hear that and so difficult at the same time, but also such a gift. Uh-huh. So that's, that's special. Yeah. How do they record the heartbeat? Is it some kind of a stethoscope connected to a microphone? Yes, you're right. There's been all different kinds of contraptions that I'm sure musicians and music therapists over the years have put together. And now there is a kind of a standard tool or equipment that's developed to very easily record the child's or adult's heartbeat. And it goes right into the computer and through the musical um, software that they can then add music above it or words or singing Mm. on top of the rhythm of the child's heartbeat. It's beautiful. Oh, neat. Well, and that rate, uh, the heart rate can also be used in really young children to help determine if they're uncomfortable and experiencing pain. Is that right? Absolutely. And so our music therapists, as well as all of our staff are monitoring those kinds of uh, physiological indicators, their heart rate, their breathing patterns, um, their temperature even, to really understand if the child's unable to verbally communicate their level of pain or comfort or discomfort. Mm-hmm. Um, those are indicators always that music therapists are observing and assessing as they're engaging in, and creating music. Mm-hmm. Well, I could see music being really useful in palliative care just because of it being a distraction from pain, getting someone's mind off the pain and onto something else. What are some other ways that music has a palliative effect? Yes, I think when we talk about the relationships that are so important and related to quality of life as well, that there can be this feeling of like, oh, the guilt and the Um, difficulties from a parent's perspective or a sibling's perspective of not feeling like they have avenues to connect with their child or son or or brother or sister when they're in palliative care, have a life-threatening condition, or the concern that so many things are um, disruptive for a child or cause them to have more seizures or more pain. Um, And that music can be that connective modality to Mm. sort of don't, you know, tune into another person and, and build on that relationship that is so important. And so I've watched, observed that with siblings so often that they're just overjoyed to see that by them engaging in music together, they're making their brother or sister so happy and it makes them happy mm-hmm. or singing to them and or improving. And I mentioned to you that some of the siblings will write about, you know, they think there's so many things that they can't do with their brother or sister that they notice other friends doing with their siblings. And so we kind of really reframe it in music. It's like, well, what can we do? There are ways that 
each sibling can connect and it looks different, of course, than what they'd hoped for. And to acknowledge that, you know, their wish to be able to run and play on their bikes together and at the park isn't possible, but there are other ways to connect that are possible and that are meaningful. And oftentimes that's through music. Wow, I hadn't thought about that, but that's really neat because not only are the family members and the patient connecting together in that moment and bringing some joy to one another, connecting emotionally, physically, if they're together, making music, but it's also probably kind of a cathartic way to process what they are experiencing. And then when you talked about recording some of that music, whether it includes the heartbeat as sort of a percussive element or not, they have that after the loss and they're in a grieving stage to have that continuity. It's a way of still being connected in some way. Absolutely. We, in the grief and, and bereavement literature, they talk often about the continued bond and anyone losing a loved one, a spouse or a parent or grandparent, and of course, a child. We have all those different ways that we're reminded of the beauty of our relationship And music is such a powerful one. You know, you just hear the first notes or part of a melody of a familiar song that was shared together over, you know, whether it's days, months, or many years. Mm -hmm. And it just brings you close to that person in that relationship um, in a very spiritual, significant way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It reminds me of a guest that we had. I don't remember the episode number, but I can link to it in the show notes. She's a professor of nostalgia and talked about the effect of just hearing a Christmas song and how it just brings you to that feeling of being at the holidays, whether good, bad, or otherwise. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. Some people have really warm, fuzzy uh, memories of holidays, and some people have more negative associations with holiday music, but that kind of is similar to what you're talking about in this situation. Absolutely. It's it's an important piece that you bring up about that, that we sometimes think, oh, this is a happy song and joy-filled song with joy-filled memories for me. But for someone else, it might also bring lots of sadness and grief. And it's Mm -hmm. a song that was shared with someone who's no longer here physically. And that's, you know, really the sense, essence and power of music is that it really does help continue bonds and moves beyond time. It, It brings us to different places in our memories and, and even into the future. And it's very powerful within pediatric palliative care as well. Mm. Well, I can imagine that would be really comforting and powerful for the people left behind after the loss of a loved one. They have that song that they made together or that the patient made that brings them back to that time. And they can choose when they want to listen to it. And and when they don't, there may be times where the feelings are too raw and they don't want to be listening to it or still really has some negative connotations. And then further down the road, they may really welcome having that to listen to and be ready to listen to that more often. Absolutely. And it might become part of the healing process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a wonderful New York Times article that was written about Crescent Cove. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. In that article, they talk about how there's a pediatric medicine saying children are not little adults. And then they go on to say, Childhood illnesses are many and varied, as are the ways young bodies respond to them, so accurate prognoses can be difficult to make. The saying is as true in death as it is in life. Children's physical, emotional, and spiritual needs are not the same as those of adults. Their families also require more support. What parents and siblings have to process the decisions made, the grief that ensues, tend to be far greater and more complicated when a child is dying. What are some other ways that are kind of unique to pediatric care and pediatric palliative care where music has some real special applications? I think the opportunity to share people's experiences through writing songs and hearing and having experienced that with both kids writing songs about their experiences and siblings writing songs about their experiences of losing it a brother or sister, and then also parents, of course. And that's, I mean, it goes without saying how powerful it is to hear someone's words put to music, but when it's at the heart of that very transformational time of losing a child or facing that that's the reality that a family is 
is looking towards knowing their son or daughter has a life-threatening condition. That provides a powerful means to communicate and express some of those really deep emotions, some of which maybe go uncommunicated because there are no words. You know, we often say that in pediatric palliative care, there are no words. And and as we know, and talking about music, it's like, well, where there are no words, there can often be music. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so much the case in pediatric palliative care that Sometimes things don't need to be said in words, but they can be shared in music and, and how, you know, we're almost held in the music and feel the love and the expressed emotion that those deep emotions through the music. Um, when it's such a deep, painful time, there can be some level of comfort from music. And I, my music therapy master's at the University of Melbourne was looking at bereaved parents' experiences of music therapy while their son or daughter was dying. Mm. And the main theme was really around this, that families felt like in the midst of adversity, immense adversity of facing that their son or daughter was going to die, music created this sense of calm, this mm-hmm. joy. It brought joy in the midst of the unspeakable grief and tragedy that they were, you know, the horror almost mm-hmm. that they were feeling like, how could we, it's not fair, you know, sure. that a, a child would die before their parents or grandparents. Mm-hmm. And Music allowed for these opportunities to laugh, to have joy, Mm. to say things that they maybe didn't know how to say in words. And Mm. and parent after parent communicated that same sentiment. And then also the sentiment that you brought up earlier about the continuing bonds and the relationships that music helps us build and keep that bridge to that relationship and our loved ones, even beyond this world. And by bringing about those memories when we hear even just the first couple of notes of a familiar song that was shared between a loved one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, music has this incredible ability to hold within it at the same time, comfort, grief, celebration, kind of all of those things that seem to be exclusive of one another, but music has a way of holding all of those somehow together. And what you were describing too reminds me of another guest that we had who was talking about the numerous studies that have been done on how words are so much more impactful when they're set to music, there's a way that they really connect with us in a, in a deep way when it's set to music because of the way that the brain processes trauma and melody within one part of the brain in words and in a different part of the brain. And I'll put a link in the show notes to that episode as well. But what you were saying really reminded me of those studies too. Absolutely. I think we have so much more to even learn. And music psychologists are doing some amazing studies around the world, uh, how our brain processes music and why it is so impactful and why we can speak when maybe, you know, somebody who's had a stroke is not speaking, but they can sing, excuse me, Mm -hmm. we can sing, but maybe not speak and just Mm -hmm. using and accessing different parts of our brain or what we say as music therapists, we're using our whole brain when we're engaging in music. And Mm -hmm. there aren't many things that we do in the world and in life that utilize our whole brain. And that makes it so powerful as well. Right. I thought it was interesting to see on your website that in metro areas around the United States, there are over 4,700 hospice homes for adults, but only three, including Crescent Cove, for children. That's correct. I know it's shocking to us as well. And I was working at the Children's Hospice in Australia, and my husband said, why don't you work at our Children's Hospice as a music therapist here in Minnesota? And I said, well, we don't have one. So that's ridiculous. Of course we do and realized we didn't and said, let's build one. Mm. And so we came back to Minnesota and and meeting with lots of leaders and realizing that we are so far behind other parts of the world when it comes to caring for our children who are dying. I think out of that fear that exists around death and children, of course, Mm -hmm. um, and that our first and foremost goal is that there be a cure for every single illness. And that's not the reality. So this model of a respite and hospice home for children is so needed mm-hmm. around our country and a funding model and a licensing model to support homes um, so many more can exist. And I, I think they will over time. You know, the first one is in California, George Mark, and then Ryan House opened in Phoenix, Arizona, and they helped us a great deal here in Minnesota with Crescent Cove. And there are other groups around the country working to open homes When did that first children's hospice in California open? What year? It was in 2004. 
Oh, so fairly recent. And then mm-hmm. the one in Arizona was after that, and Crescent Cove opened in 2018. That's right. Okay. There is some kind of a connection with Crescent Cove and Harmon Killebrew in terms of funding, and hospice was a topic that was very close to his heart. Tell us about that connection. Yes, Harmon was an advocate for dignity at the end of life for all people, including children. And he spent a lot of the years at the end of his life raising money to build Miracle League fields for children with disabilities to play baseball. And at the same time was being hired all around the country to speak about and advocate for dignity at the end of life for kids and adults and cared a great deal and wanted to see a home like this come to fruition in Minnesota. And it was near, he was nearing the end of life. And there was a lovely article about his decision to enter hospice as he was dying of esophageal cancer. And I reached out to his widow and wife, Nita Killebrew, and mentioned to her what we're trying to do and asked if there's any way they'd be involved or allow Harmon's name to be a part of what we're doing. We were looking for a champion Mm. um, because, of course, you could imagine going around the community 10 years ago when we were starting as a nonprofit Mm -hmm. with the goal of having a home like this. People are saying, what? (laughs) You know, why don't we, if we don't have one, we must not need one. And I say, no. Mm it's greatly needed. And, and so his legacy has just helped a great deal in bringing other twins legends to participate at our galas and um, bring more awareness um, and support from the community. So they didn't fund it so much, but their involvement has been so important to allowing the opportunity for other people to become more involved and support what we're doing. And people who cared about Harmon then said, what is Harmon's name connected to? And that really made made a big difference. Mm, sure. Well, and I thought it was neat to see on your website that his last public statement was, I have spent the last decade of my life promoting hospice care and educating people on its benefits. I am very comfortable taking this next step and experiencing the compassionate care that hospice provides. And uh, it was clear from the information about him and his comments on the subject that he was really passionate about the value of hospice care and would think that helping build this home was as important as any of his legendary baseball accomplishments. Right. His wife and widow Nita shared with us that he said he always wanted to do something more than baseball and to be known for something more than baseball and hospice awareness was so important to him. And she just was so confident that this is, you know, and we feel his presence too, as you, we talk about continued bonds and presence, like mm-hmm. we're on Twin Lake. Crescent Cove is located on Twin Lake yeah. in, in Brooklyn Center. And it's the third home and he was number three. And there's so many beautiful synchronicities. And we notice that even with the kids who are supported by Crescent Cove after they die, the different ways that they're Spirit shows up to support other families who are going through a similar difficult time losing their child at Crescent Cove. And we're just all connected and, mm-hmm. and music helps us to be, all, you know, to be connected as well. Uh huh. I ask all my guests to give listeners what I call an improv, uh, try this at home, a suggestion or practical tip that will enhance li- listeners' lives with music. Do you have any suggestions today for us? Sure. Uh, so I was thinking about the times where we've used improv and those moments with siblings in particular, and that familiar music is obviously, and if we're talking about working with children, songs that are familiar to kids and then just adjusting the words. And I, I notice even my own kids, they notice me singing different words to a song that they know, and then they start kind of doing the same thing. So mm-hmm. if it's, you know, B-I-N-G-O and bingo was his name, oh, uh-huh. it's like, we got to get our math done and that's the way it's going to go, you know, <laughs> just different things that make them sort of giggle when they are being kind of told sternly, we need to get to sure. this. And it allows that sort of reprieve, even as a parent or someone working with children, because it catches our attention. And like you talked about earlier, Mindy uses a different part of our brain. Mm-hmm. And we're always, when we're getting someone's attention, sometimes they're just so focused on something else. And is to redirect and re-guide with melody or harmony and or rhythm uh-huh. um, or adding rhythm. I notice too, if I just rhythmically say something um, instead of speaking it, that you know gets noticed, e- you know, more easily and more quickly. Ah. But yeah, making those sweet little adjustments to familiar songs. 
Great idea. <laughs> Love it. Well, if people want to learn more about Crescent Cove and connect with you, connect with your work there, you have a great website, crescentcove.org. There's also links on there to you on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'll include all those links in the show notes. And Katie, you didn't send me this information, but I want to let listeners know that all services and stays provided at Crescent Cove are provided to kids and families at no cost at all because of the generosity of donors who contribute to Crescent Cove. And if you as a listener are hearing about this and thinking this is incredible, uh, I'm so glad they have this. I wish there was more of that. I would Maybe I wish there was something like this for a situation that took place in your personal life and you want to get more involved. There's a great tab on Crescent Cove's website that sa- says how you can help. And that link takes you to more information on where you can donate, you can volunteer, there's a wish list you can help uh, fill and complete. There's also a lot of special events that are fundraisers. If you're here in the Twin Cities, there are some dates on there coming up that you can check out. I also love that Craft Happy app. It's an (laughs) app that the money that you pay for the app goes towards supporting Crescent Cove. But then with that, you get buy one, get one drinks at all of these different wineries and breweries and distilleries. I think they're all in Minnesota. Is that right? I believe so as well. But yeah, that's really fun. Okay. Yeah. And then you also have a legacy brick paver where you can donate a paver. So lots of really varied and practical ways to get involved for listeners who want to get a little bit more involved in all the great work that you're doing. I ask all of my guests to close out our conversation with a musical ending, a coda, by sharing a song or a story about a moment that music enhanced your life. Tell us a little bit about the song that you're going to be sharing with us today. So I'll sing a song that's written by parents who is, oh, it makes me, it's been quite a few years, but their daughter was at home at the end of life. She was a newborn with trisomy 13 and they were doing some writing and I asked if they might be interested to write her a song to share their love. They were concerned at the time that she wouldn't know that how much they loved her. They Mm -hmm. felt like, you know, it was difficult to comfort her. She was often uncomfortable and crying and in pain and had lots of reflux. And Mm -hmm. so even in feeding her, it was just like, she wasn't ever very comfortable. And they noticed that during the music, she was calm and quiet. In fact, one of the times I even took out some little rhythm instruments that I use with other children, just as a way to sort of connect that this is their baby and things that they imagine doing with their baby, playing music and instruments and being a part of music groups and things that you bring your children to sometimes. And she, you know, at, at first, we were just cautious because we didn't want to make her any more uncomfortable. Yeah, and um, how old did the, you say she was? She was just a few weeks old. She oh, was really little okay. at home. So we had that experience to even share some music, but she was very calm when we would sing mm-hmm. and quiet and sometimes even alert and other times she'd fall asleep. So they knew immediately that the music was comforting and they kind of found a way to connect with her. Mm-hmm. And in some of their writing, I suggested as they are working, you know, journaling was a way that they were expressing themselves during this time of living in that moment to moment, is our baby going to be alive the next hour? They were told she might live for a couple of weeks or months. And um, so as you can imagine, they didn't know when that time was going to come exactly and kind of holding their breaths almost. And the music also gave them a chance to kind of catch their breath and Mm -hmm. become more grounded and present with her instead of in that anxiety of Mm -hmm. when is this moment going to come? And so this is a beautiful song that they wrote and it's called You Are Love. And I'll just sing the um, chorus a couple of times in memory and thinking of all these little ones. So mm, thank you. Thanks, Mindy. Okay. You are love. I love you deeper than the ocean. I love you brighter than the sun I love you wider than the skies You are love You are love I love you 
deeper than the ocean. I love you brighter than the sun. I love you wider than the skies. You are love. You are love. You are love. Thank you so much for joining me today. As always, all links discussed in today's episode can be found in the show notes on my website at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast slash episode 34. There is also a link to that page in the episode details right in your podcast app. As I mentioned in the beginning of the episode, there is a unifying aspect to the COVID-19 challenges and restrictions that we're all experiencing. As we're all practicing social distancing, I'd love to virtually connect with you. If you come across any examples of how music is helping people cope with COVID-19 challenges, send them my way so I can share them. All my contact links are on my website, mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast. Until next week, may your life be enhanced with music.